In this video, we're going to start increasing the difficulties problems even more, and we're going to do it in everybody's favorite way by introducing recursion into our analysis. So here we have a function, func5, and it has a recursive call appearing down here. And there is randomness in this because we are defining a random number, and then if that number is even, we will perform that recursive call. So this is making the idea that some of the time we might need to make recursive calls and other times we might not need to. Let's start by seeing if we can analyze the worst case runtime. So let's look at the worst case. Well, what is the worst case? The worst case is that we would every single time perform that recursion. This is that K is always even. If k is always even, the code up here has no randomness in it. It takes a fixed cn time. And then we are always executing the recursive call. So t of n would equal cn plus t of n minus 1. We've seen this recurrence relation several times, so we'll go through it really quickly. t of n equals cn plus make a substitution, and we get c times n minus 1 plus t of n minus 2. Make another substitution, we get cn plus c times n minus 1 plus c times n minus 2 plus t of n minus 3. The pattern that we might notice here is that this is cn plus c n minus 1 plus down till plus c of n minus k minus 1 plus t of n minus k. We had to be a bit careful there with that k minus 1 because we are always off by 1 with that term. This then we set n minus k equal to 0 and get k equals n. And then we get cn plus c n minus 1 plus all the way down until we get c times n minus n minus 1 plus c y c well t of one is constant so uh, at t that's a t of one at the end there this is a an arithmetic summation it converges to c times n times n plus one over two i went through that rather quickly because we've seen that summation several times before now how can we analyze this as a expected runtime because this said k was always even that is very unlikely. That's like getting a coin flip and getting a heads every single time. That is very unlikely. So how can we analyze this? We could try to use our definition. Maybe we would say we can write the sum over all possible outcomes, probability of that outcome, and the time of that outcome. But there's not many outcomes, so it doesn't really seem necessary to write this out as a summation. So maybe we try to use our conditional probability instead. And there are really two conditions, whether or not k is even, whether or not k is odd. So our expected runtime, et of n, we can compute that by saying, well, what is the probability that k is even times the expected time given k is even? plus the probability that k is odd times the expected time given k is odd. We know, possibly, what is the probability that k is odd? And we might actually need to be careful here, because for small values of n, if we're picking an integer, for example, between 1, 2, and 3, the probability of, that, of a number being odd there is only 1 and 3. But as we have larger and larger values of n, which when we're doing asymptotic analysis is all we care about, that probability is going to be very, very, very nearly one half. 
and for various values along the way, it will also be one half. If n was four, the probability would be one one half. If n was six, it'd be one half. So for all of the even numbers, it is one half, and for all of the odd numbers, it's slightly off from one half. So this probability here, that's one half, and this probability there, that's one half. And what is the expected time given that k is even? Well, let's look at the code. Well, no matter what, we are going to do that cn plus if k is even, we are going to go into that if statement and make a recursive call. But we're not just making any recursive call. We, this is an ex, the expected time of n minus 1. We're taking an expected value across everything, so the time on the right-hand side should also be the expected time. Our last term over here, the expected value when k is odd, well, if k is odd, we still do that for loop, but then we do not make the recursive calls. We have cn over there. Let's use all this information together. We get e t of n equals one half times cn plus e t of n minus one plus one half times cn. Now, we can distribute and see what our recurrence relation is. Notice that outside of the fact that I have the letters E, T instead of T, all of the probabilistic analysis is now done. We are simply analyzing a problem that I could have given you in Foundations 1, or you could have solved after our recurrence unit. So this equals E, T of N. I have one half CN and one half CN, so that's uh, one copy of CN, plus one half et of n minus 1. You might notice something strange here, which is that if we were thinking about this in our literal sense, where we imagine the coefficient in front of our recursive call on the right-hand side, this coefficient here, being the number of recursive calls, it doesn't really make much sense to say that we have half of a recursive call. So this is a bit of a strange recurrence relation, and that arises from the fact that we are using probabilities. There's nothing left to do now but to analyze this, so let's, go, let's crack to it equals cn plus one half times make a substitution plug in n minus one and we get c times n minus one plus one half et n minus two distribute our one half and we get cn plus one half c times n minus one plus i'm going to write this as one over two squared et n minus 2. Let's make one more substitution. This equals cn plus 1 half c n minus 1 plus 1 over 2 squared times quantity. We have a cn. We're plugging in n minus 2. So we have c times n minus 2 plus 1 half et of n minus 3. Let's distribute the 1 half squared. This equals cn plus 1 half c n minus 1 plus 1 over 2 squared times c times n minus 2 plus 1 over 2 cubed et of n minus 3. Now let's try and identify a pattern here. If we look, we have three terms and a t of n minus 3, and the terms have some nice things. We have cn minus 0 and a 2 to the 0. We have a 1 half and a n minus 1, a 1 half squared, and n minus 2, and a 1 half cubed. All that looks nice. And similarly for all of the terms above. So my first set of terms here looks like we're adding up terms that look like c of n c times m minus i times 1 over 2 to the i. And our last term looks like 1 over 2 to the k et of n minus k. And just to make sure we can finalize this, the power of 2 in the last term of my leading terms is always lagged by 1 compared to the term in the e. So this is a k minus 1 there. Let's move this down. 
Now we have a summation analyze. This looks really messy compared to what we've seen in the past, but let's try and deal with it. What's our base case? Well, let's scroll up and check. Our base case was n equals one. So we need to choose uh, k so that n minus k is equal to one, which is k equals n minus one. Let's use that. E t of n equals the sum from i equals zero to n minus one minus one, that's n minus two, c n minus i, one half to the i, plus one over two to the k, is one over two to the n minus one, times e t of one. e t of one is just constant. So, now all we have left to do is to identify what do we do with that summation. This might not be obvious, but let's see what we can do. Your first attempt might be to try and bound it using our standard bounding techniques. Say this is less than or equal to the sum from i equals 0 to n minus 2 of c times n minus n minus 2 times one half to the m minus two, and you can keep doing that. Unfortunately, this will not work. If you want if you want to be convinced of that, just try it and see what you get for an upper bound, and then try and bound it below. You will not be able to do that. The primary reason should be, on a conceptual level, because of the, the geometric part. We have two competing parts in this summation. We have an arithmetic looking part, and a geometric looking part. The geometric part is decreasing so fastly that it is the more important term. So to bound this above, what we're going to do is we are going to replace every single term in that summation with cn times one over two to the i. Then we're gonna keep the c over two to the m minus one out here. And now we can factor out a cn out of that first summation. From i equals 0 to n minus 2 of 1 half to the i plus c over 2 to the m minus 1. Now we just need to bound a geometric summation. That 1 half to the i is just a geometric summation. We do that by bounding it by an infinite geometric series. Sum from i equals 0 to infinity of 1 half to the i plus this other weird term. This is less than or equal to. That series we've seen 38 times by now in this class, it converges to 2. And then plus this other weird term. This other weird term is just less than or equal to a constant, so it's not affecting our runtime. So this is in big O of n. It remains to be shown that it's in big omega of n. I claim we don't even need to do any of this nonsense down here to show that. I claim we could have just looked at the code and easily seen that this was in big omega of n. Looking at the code, we if we are not in the base case, if we are in this part of the code, it is clearly in big omega of n because we are executing this code here no matter what. The simple cost of executing that for loop before even debating whether or not we're making a recursive call costs cn. So you can see that directly from the code because of the for loop. Or if we looked at our expansion of terms, the first term was cn. So for sure, et of n is greater than or equal to that. So we have also that et of n is greater than or equal to cn and above. Just to specify, we had et of n less than or equal to that. And with those two things, that means et of n. So et of n must be in theta of n, which is different than our worst case. If we scroll up, our worst case was theta of n squared, which I never wrote down. And our best case is actually c a n or theta of n. So here our expected runtime was theta of n. 
For this problem, the only place the probability actually showed up was in this little chunk here. That's it. For a lot of these probabilistic analysis questions, the first step is understanding how can we use our probability to set it up in a way that we can then solve it using foundations one level techniques. Once we've set it up like that, it can sometimes be a difficult foundations one problem because of strange coefficients, or maybe we need to be careful when bounding, but it is still fundamentally just a recurrence relation to be solved.